Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I, it is my privilege to welcome Brad Stone to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. He's here today to discuss his book, The Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon. He's a senior writer at Bloomberg Businessweek and was given unprecedented access to the very private Bezos, as well as former and current Amazon employees. He gives us a sneak peek into how Amazon has revolutionized the retail experience. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you, Amy, and thank you guys for having me. Uh, my, uh, my colleague, Stephen Levy at Wired Magazine, I think came here to talk about his book about Google. And my friend, Adam Lashinsky, came here maybe a year, year and a half ago to talk about his book about Apple. So it's great that, that you guys here at Microsoft are so accommodating of our, <laughs> of our projects about uh, your partners and, in some cases, your competitors. So I wanted to you know, just talk for a couple of minutes, because I'd much prefer this to be more of a, a Q&A and an interactive forum. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And then a few of them, I feel like, more interesting anecdotes for the, from the book and the ones that stand out for me now that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the book. So about myself, um, I've covered technology for about 15 years. I was at the magazine formerly known as Newsweek um, for many years. And I, I covered technology from Silicon Valley. And uh, after that, I, I was at the New York Times for a few years, and now Bloomberg Business Week. And I started covering Amazon in, I think, the late 90s. And I remember my first trip to Amazon, and, and maybe my first trip here to Seattle was right after the Nisqually earthquake in 2001. And I came to visit Amazon, and they were, at the time, they were talking a lot because the share price had gone from you know, 110, and it was, it, was, it was near or in the single digits. And I went over to their old building, the, the Pacific Medical Center, up on the hill. And I remember it because you couldn't go in the front entrance uh, because of the earthquake damage. So you had to kind of go in through the back garage. And there was a sign there, a placard, warning of falling bricks. And it was like an incredible metaphor for Amazon at the time, uh, a company that had actually risen to prominence during the dot-com boom. And uh, you know, Jeff Bezos was time man of the year. And then in the, in the course of a year had really suffered this incredible kind of decline and fall in the eyes of, of its shareholders, some of its biggest proponents, and even a lot of his employees. Uh, it's interesting how many people left during that period of time. And I started you know, following Amazon pretty closely then. And it's you know, really the, the story of you know, an incredible entrepreneur and founder who ultimately kind of proved himself and his abilities as an operator. And over the years in following Amazon, it was many ways in which the company evolved. But one of them was clearly in its public relations. It went from being this voluble company, and you, know, you couldn't keep Bezos out of the press. He was, always, he was everywhere, and it was always Amazon.com because he was trying to brand the, the website in people's eyes. And for whatever reason, probably because of the licks he took you know, during the dot-com bus, he became more remote, a little more secretive. He stopped doing the CNBC appearances altogether. He would surface uh, every so often to talk about a new product, um, Mechanical Turk, the crowdsourcing engine, or, or search inside the book. And then, of course, the Kindles, and he would do press conferences. But, but by and large, they became a little more secretive, um, more, certainly more remote. And about two years ago, um, around the time, probably when the Walter Isaacson Steve Jobs book was coming down the pike, I kind of realized that there, has, there had never been a great Amazon book. You know, there, there were a number of great Microsoft books, particularly in the 90s. Um, you know, there, there have been a number of great Apple books. There was a, a, a great Google book by Stephen Levy. There were even some Facebook books. <laughs> but because of its remoteness and Bezos' secrecy, there were some early attempts at writing the great Amazon book. Uh, but no one, you know, I felt like no one really cracked it. And, along with Microsoft and 
Google and Apple, Amazon is arguably one of the companies that is changing the world, right? It's changed the way a lot of us shop and read. And I face this challenge uh, because in, in a lot of these accounts, you want to get some measure of cooperation from the company. Uh, it makes it better. I mean, there's a sort of model uh, you know, of a book where the outsider kind of slings rocks from the outside. There's a pretty good, although pretty negative book about Walmart called The Walmart Effect. And I read that, and it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell more of the inside story. So um, I decided that I would uh, you know, try to cajole at least some cooperation from Amazon. And I'll tell you what I did. As many of you know, in fact, are there any former Amazon employees here? OK, so if you guys could leave. No, no. <laughs> no. So some of you know that uh, you know, there are many idiosyncratic customs inside Amazon, and all of them tailored towards the way that Jeff Bezos likes to process information. And one of them is these narrative documents. I mean, he's a huge reader. It's actually, I have a, an, an appendix in the book that just chronicles all the books that were behind Amazon's major decisions. And you know, another element is that they start every meeting with what they call a narrative, a six-page document. And it's his preferred way of processing information. And sadly, he is an enemy of PowerPoint. And, uh, you know, and, and, and wants, you know, wants a lot of thought to go into every meeting. It's actually one of the ways that he maximizes the use of his time. Anyway, long story short, so I bring a, so I, I don't ask for permission, because I know that Jeff has told many authors that it's too early to write a book about Amazon, which is sort of extraordinary when you think that it's been 20 years and they've got 90,000 employees and, and they've changed the world. And it's his way of kind of keeping, keeping us at arm's length. So I didn't ask for permission, but I told them I was going to do it anyway. And he allowed me to come up to Seattle and to kind of talk to him uh, informally about the idea. And so I prepared the narrative. And you know, I, so I pulled it out of my briefcase as I sit down with him, and I push it across the table. And of course, he, he starts laughing hysterically which is you know, another element of the Bezos persona, this maniacal, villainous laugh, uh, which is actually in, somewhat endearing but somewhat scary because it's, there's not always a joke. It's sometimes, <laughs> it sometimes really is. He, well, as, as one of his colleagues told me privately, he's weaponized the laugh. So it's a little scary. Um, so I gave him the, the narrative. Long story short, um, he, he said it was too early to write a book about Amazon, but he approved um, interviews with his senior executives, his parents, a number of his friends. I've talked to him probably a dozen times over the years around product announcements. I drew from that material, and I spoke to him around product announcements in the two years that I spent writing the book. But I will say that you know, in all the sanctioned interviews with Amazon employees, they are so remarkably disciplined and on target. And actually, as I talk a little bit, I'll, I'll try to derive some like you know, Bezos rules of the road here. And, and rule number one, and, and John Doerr, the venture capitalist, calls this the Bezos theory of communicating. He, it's a little frustrating as a journalist. They talk to their customers. You know, you could be a journalist sitting in the room, and really they're talking over your head to their customers. You know, simple, positive messages around some basic principles. Uh, it's it's frustrating, uh, but you know, but you have to admire it, like with so many things about Amazon. Now, luckily for this project, there was a critical mass of, of current and former Amazon employees and executives who believed that the story was worthwhile, and that was really sort of the foundation upon which the book is built. So the second sort of point I'd like to discuss is, is, um, is kind of complexity and, and chaos. I, as a journalist, you know, we tend to like, you know, look at Microsoft and look at Google or Amazon and define it by who its rivals are. I'm sure you guys have all sort of encountered that thinking. And for Amazon, as, you know, as a as a journalist, I thought, you know, first it was Barnes and Noble, and then it was eBay, and then it was Walmart, and now it's still Walmart, but also it's you guys and Apple and Google. But as I really dove into the book, I started to conclude that Amazon's biggest rival was always complexity and chaos. And if you think about it, most companies, as they grow, they really, the, the complexity expands primarily in one dimension, and that's internally, culturally. You have to scale all your processes and your culture as you get larger. Um, you know, for you guys, though, uh, you know, a, a, co a copy of Windows or Office, it's, you know, if you have, I'm radically simplifying here, but 
you know, a million customers versus 50 million customers, it's, it's the same piece of software. You know, Apple is, is, is creating the same iPad. Uh, you know, in fact, they're not even creating the same iPad. Foxconn is, is dealing with the complexity of manufacturing. Amazon, from the time in the, in the early 90s when it's three guys down in Bellevue, you know, to today it has 90,000 employees, 70,000 part-time workers now for the holidays. At every stage, at every additional you know, million or 10 million customers or a billion, every additional billion dollars in revenue, it has to completely transform itself, not just internally, but in, in its fulfillment centers. You know, they're essentially in the business of, going, of, of shipping and storing products from point A to point B. And that system looks a lot different and has to be a lot more efficient at different stages of the company's growth. So I'll tell you my favorite story from kind of examining the fulfillment network. You know, Amazon went from, from like this warehouse model where it's kind of your tattooed workers down on Dawson Street in Seattle to a more Wal uh, Walmart-like distribution model. And they hired a lot of Walmart employees in the late 90s to create it. And of course, that didn't work so well. So they, they brought all their white collar workers from Seattle and spread them out into the fulfillment centers at, during the holidays to try and help with the holiday rush. And that was phase two, and that didn't work so well. And then phase three, they actually kind of start to get good. They bring in some manufacturing folks and go to a manufacturing model. And um, you know, they start to hire temporary workers. So about 2006 in Coffeyville, Kansas, they're still just getting good at this and, and no longer bringing white collar workers out from Seattle, but, but basically busing in employees from rural areas or Indian reservations. I mean, it, because if you think about it, they have to locate their fulfillment centers in rural, low population areas. They don't want to collect sales tax. And yet their staffing needs quickly overwhelm their ability to, to service their demand. So in Coffeeville in 2006, there's this legend, which I be, began to call in my notes the legend of Hovelman, H-O-V-E-L. And you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out if this was true or just myth. And, and essentially, you know, Hubble Man, you know, comes in with the temporary uh, workforce, and he's showing up to work, and they they know that he's showing up every day, but he's actually not logging any actual work during the day, and they can tell that. But you know, because of the complexity and the chaos of their systems, I guess the systems aren't linked, and they can't quite figure out why this guy is showing up, but not doing any actual work. So about a week passes, and they they start to they decide to follow him. And they find that he's showing up to work. He's, he's on the bus from the rural area during the holiday craze. And, but he's actually sneaking out and going to the back of the fulfillment center to a pile of wooden pallets. And he's actually tunneled out a space for himself, a little hovel inside the big mountain of pallets. And they go in there, and he's actually furnished it with products from the massive fulfillment center. <laughs> so he's got, he's got an actual like, nice little den. He's got a bed. You know, from the from the bedding section of the, and he's got you know entertainment and magazines, and in the most disturbing detail of the story, which I confirmed as being true, he had some pornography in the walls from some of the pornographic calendars that Amazon had. So God knows what he was doing in there, but they you know they they you know they they bust him and they march him out back to the bus, and I thought you know apart apart from being a kind of great story really emblematic of the way in which you know, Amazon had to conquer chaos. You know, we all view it as being you know, consumed with its rivals. And look, I tell a lot of stories in the book about how it did identify and pursue competitors. But really, and I think this goes back to my first point, the reason, one of the reasons why they are kind of secretive is that they're completely consumed with mastering the dynamics of their own business. And, and, you know, and they continue to be. Now, I think they've actually figured out you know, quite a bit of the, of the fulfillment center challenge. And now we see it. They're building them all over the country. And they, they, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a manufacturing process in and of itself. Uh, so getting back to kind of the rules there, um, you know, Amazon or Bezos rule number two is you know, conquer your own internal challenges and complexities first and, and worry about the external competition later. Uh, so the third kind of story I'd like to tell is, you know, the the remarkable way way in which they have altered the book publishing business. Um, you know, Amazon doesn't have a lot of friends in book publishing right now. In fact, it's been uncomfortable for me because I've been going into some bookstores. Like I'm here for my reading, 
And they're like, you know, oh yeah, we, we've chucked your book in, into the dumpster in the back because they really do not like Amazon in a way that's, you know, not surprising, but, but you know, overt. And the book publishing business, I mean, Amazon is their largest distributor. And yet, you know, they're spitting blood and nails. And it was, there was, there's awkwardness abounds in the, the actual process of writing and publishing a book about Amazon because, you know, even my overseers at Little Brown, who were great, you know, clearly sort of very biased about the content. They rely on Amazon, and Amazon's their greatest competitor. So the, to me, a lot of that derives from the story of the Kindle in 2007. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to compress it, but, um, you know, Amazon's, of course, a famously data-focused company, and they saw in about 2004 that Apple had completely devoured or altered the dynamics of their own CD-selling business with the iPod and iTunes. And they, you know, and actually a lot of that derives from the fact that Bezos himself, you know, never really a, a music lover. Um, Jobs, of course, Steve Jobs, you know, a devout fan of music, <coughs> dated Joan Baez, um, and, and, and really kind of foresaw the opportunity there, there with digital music. Um, and so, you know, Bezos began to think, well, is it possible that, you know, Apple or Google or Microsoft could one day attack our franchise, you know, the business we started with, books. And he had actually been tracking kind of the, the e-books industry for a while. I actually kind of uncovered in the book that he was close to investing in Rocketbook, this way ahead of its time e-reader in the 1990s, and that kind of fell apart, and Barnes & Noble ended up investing in them, you know, a great example of, of being too early. <laughs> Uh, and, and so Jeff kind of basically decided that he would, you know, that he had to do this or somebody else would do it for him and, and take Amazon's business away. So he went to uh, a guy in his organization named Steve Kessel, who I actually refer to in the book as a Jeff bot, uh, which I'm sure he probably doesn't like. But it's, it's, it's you know, there, there are an, this extraordinary class of people at Amazon that have so internalized the mannerisms and the sayings and the point of view of Jeff that like, you know, they, they, it's, it's like they're, they're, you know, clones of the CEO. Uh, and he, he said, Bezos says to Kessel, um, Kessel's running the media business, you know, very successful executive and lots of people reporting to him. And he says, I'm taking away your whole job. You know, your new job right now is to put all your old colleagues out of business. And Bezos and his senior team had read uh, The Innovator's Dilemma by Clay Christensen. And, you know, extraordinary aspect of the company was they don't just read these books, but they really digest them and, and, um, and, and act on them. And he told Kessel, you know, I want you to proceed as if your job is to put your old colleagues out of business. You're going to go build a hardware product. And I also talked to a lot of other senior executives at Amazon who thought this was madness. You know, Jeff Wilkie, probably the number two guy at Amazon, you know, he comes from Allied Signal. He knew how messy manufacturing was. He was against it. Diego Piacentini came from Apple. He's a senior exec. You know, he, he thought it was a bad idea. And, you know, it's an example of the power of the founder, as, you know, as you guys know well, to kind of come in and say, we're doing this. I, I know it's going to be hard. We'll figure out how to do it. And the rest, of course, with the Kindle business is, is history. But you know, Apple, in creating the iPod and getting the cooperation of the music labels, had the specter of privacy, uh, sorry, of piracy to really scare the music labels. Apple got cooperation from the music guys because they almost had no other alternative. Amazon encountered a, a lot of resistance as it tried to build its Kindle business because book piracy really wasn't all that prevalent. I mean, you could pirate books, but uh, you know the format's horrible, and of course, there's you know nobody wants to read a book on their on their PC screen. And so he he had to kind of turn Amazon into the boogeyman that that you know piracy is in music. And they they went out to the book publishers and they threatened and cajoled and they and I account for all this in the book. And they you know they threatened to to take books out of the recommendation engine, which you know, accounted for a good deal of the sell-through on the backlist. And uh, you know, they, they, you know, they, they yelled and screamed. In some cases, they went to the, directly to the authors and the agents of, of, you know, of some of these publishers. And it was like kind of two years of brutality. And then, of course, the main thing they did was withhold their pricing strategy, you know, the, 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 their plan to price eBooks at 999. 
And we all know that that you know, sort of metastasized into, into the deal with Apple and an antitrust suit. And you know, I feel the lesson there is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kind of take a stab at articulating this, but, but customer focus can often uh, justify, in the, in, the, in the eyes of the outside world, customer focus kind of can offset a pretty remarkable degree of ruthlessness. I mean, Amazon pummeled the book publishers and then ended up afterward going into business with them. But because they set ebooks at $9.99 and because they kind of constantly invented, first with the Kindle um, and, then, and then some of these imprints, they do Kindle serials and Kindle signals, the novellas, and now they have Kindle fan fiction. They've created a lot of opportunity for authors. In a lot of these kind of instances, what I found is there's really not a simple answer. You know, Amazon is brutal, and they're a ferocious competitor, and they're also very inventive. And I think it's one of the reasons why, in the you know, in the public eye, I mean, certainly Microsoft has taken its turn as the tech industry pinata, and Google has had its turn. Um, and as we know, in the world of retail, you know, Walmart gets pummeled constantly, and I think Bezos kind of correctly identified that. You can get away with a lot as long as you're inventive. And that, to me, is the lesson of the Kindle story. And I'll just tell one more story, and then we'll kind of open it up. Uh, but I think this is sort of perfect for, for you guys, because you know, like Microsoft, Amazon is a platform, and it's also the largest player on that platform. And as, as we all know, there's, there, there are no more stickier situations to be in than that. And it also can attract quite a bit of, of antitrust scrutiny. But of course, Amazon has now become really the, you know, the most successful e-commerce platform for other sellers in the West. And it's also the largest seller on that platform. And it, that creates all kinds of drama. And I'll tell you the quick story of the knife maker Wusthof. And I actually found, you know, for whatever reason, the product of knives was very appropriate for the kind of classic story that they had to tell, which is this bloody story of doing business with Amazon. And Wusthof is from Solingen, Germany, you know, the, the city of blades. And they expand to the United States in the 70s. And uh, you know, in the 90s, it's the nephew of the founder. Uh, and they decide that they want to start selling their knives on Amazon. And for a couple of years, that works out well. And then they're selling to Amazon, so Amazon's first party business. And then they, they find that Amazon is, is actually kind of discounting, seriously discounting uh, their knives and undercutting you know, all, their, all their small mom and pop distributors and their other chain stores. Well, they've got, you know, for, for Wusthof now, this is a big problem, right? Because they've got a manufacturing facility of like high paid artisans in Germany. It's not a low cost operation. And you know, if Amazon's going to discount, you're going to put a lot of pressure on their other distributors. Maybe they'll cut their prices, and then the wholesale price falls. So we see this again and again, over and over. Uh, Wusthof's complaint was not unique, and they stopped selling on Amazon for a couple of years. And then they go back, and they, you know, the attraction for all these guys is the volume. You know, you can't. It's a. It's heroin. You know, like it, your numbers are great on Amazon because they've got a critical mass of customers. And so they start selling again, you know, and at this point, Amazon's third-party marketplace is really humming. And this is where other smaller retailers come and sell, you know, right on the same page. Well, Wusthof is, you know, the sales are great, but then they notice that there are a lot of these third-party sellers with mysterious names who are, and they're discounting. And these are entities like Amazing Deals Online, and, you know, who knows who they are? There's, Amazon offers no way of uh, contacting. And they could be buying knives from the back of the bus, outside of Bed Bath & Beyond, the back of the truck. We, you know, they don't know. Now Amazon, you know, it, one of its core convictions is lowest price. And so when Amazon sees amazing deals online, cutting the pri price of the knives, you know, they start discounting. And, and, and now you have what all these guys refer to as the race to the bottom, right? The price is falling. Um, again, the third party, uh, the mom and pop knife distributors, they're on the phone to Wusthof saying, my business is getting killed, customers are coming in, I've got a match. And long story short, they, you know, Harold Wusthof, the nephew of the founder, has to come over from Germany. He, he goes over to South Lake Union, you know, and says, we're done. And Amazon actually, and this is a story in the book, you know, is, is, 
is kicking and screaming. You know, selection is one of their core values. And they actually you know, threaten uh, that they will start advertising for some of Wustoff's competitors when people search for Wustoff knives. And they kind of threaten that they'll go and source product independently. And for a while, they do. You know, they're they're uh, intermediaries where you can source this product. And it highlights this ongoing tension and probably the opportunity for other e-commerce players that Amazon faces, you know, which is it's trying to be a platform, you know, and it's trying to be the largest player on that platform. And you know, just like you guys encountered in the 90s, I think that's where probably the greatest scrutiny comes for Amazon. In fact, this week we saw Germany start to ask, you know, where the antitrust authorities can be pretty aggressive, start to ask questions. Uh, because one of the things Amazon does is insist that third-party retailers set the lowest price anywhere on Amazon. And this is another series of headaches because Amazon's charging commissions. So its price, uh, so the cost of doing business on Amazon is actually higher for some of these third parties. Uh, in, a, in a way, um, it might be viewed as anti-competitive because uh, as what the result is that these retailers have to increase their prices on their own websites to, pr to make sure that they're setting the lowest possible price on Amazon. Now, hopefully, I haven't lost you there. Um, but you know, it's another another lesson really is you, you know, and Apple has discovered this with eBooks is that as long as you're lowering the price for customers, you're you're safe in the eyes of most antitrust authorities. But as soon as you get into the situation where prices are going up, then you start to attract attention, and it'll be one of the more interesting, uh, uh, you know, one of the more interesting uh, points. Of, uh, of conflict with Amazon in the years ahead. Now, at this point, I'd love to stop blabbing and kind of open it up to questions. Um, I'm sure uh, you guys all are, are constantly observing uh, the, neighbor, the neighbors across Lake Washington, and I, I love, I'd love to hear what you think. Sure. <laughs> Right, is it, does it all spring fully formed from the mind of Jeff Bezos? To a remarkable extent, you know, it, it, it kind of does. I mean, every, every you know, big decision and big initiative um, is, is founder driven, and that's the power and magic of the founder, and it's, you know, and it's irreplaceable. And Bezos, like Gates, or like Steve Jobs, you know, is, is, is one of these rare guys that, um, uh, you know, that, that is the entrepreneur and the innovator but also has tremendous ability as an operator. Now, he is also different in that he really does celebrate the small innovations. And in fact, I quote him in the book as saying, we don't have many big advantages, so we have to weave a rope of smaller advantages. And actually, you see that you know, with, with like the new Kindle Fire. All the little things they do, like, like integrating their IMDb movie database into the, into the video watching program via a feature called X-Ray. You know, weaving together all these small little advantages, you know, to create reasons for customers to enter the Amazon ecosystem. And I do think, and I'm probably really generalizing when I say that all the big jumps come from Bezos, but I really do think that they have, you know, created a culture, and it's not an easy one or a friendly one, but creating a culture that's really does uh, incur encourage everyone to suggest and to pursue these small innovations. Yes? Right. So the question is about Amazon's efforts to, to create its own programming, much like Netflix is, uh, is, is creating TV shows. You know, Amazon is, is uh, with a, something called Amazon Studios, is, um, is funding programs. They've, they've got a lot of sitcoms. They've got a couple of children's shows. You know, the reason I call the book The Everything Store, and that ultimately I kind of conclude that it's The Everything Company, is that it's, it's, it's expanding blob-like in every direction. It's, it's incredible how great their ambitions are. And you know, I think they, they um, you know, Jeff sees video as being kind of one of the core uh, you know, gateways to, to these digital 
ecosystems. Um, you know, and they're now in competition with Microsoft and with Google and with Apple to create a set of, you know, of, of digital services and hardware. You know, and, and to the quote that I just relayed, we don't have many big advantages, so we have to weave a rope of smaller advantages. Well, arguably, Amazon should be probably the underdog in this new kind of digital ecosystem battle, right? It doesn't have any indigenous you know, hardware experience with products like the Xbox. Uh, and, and certainly, um, you, know, you know, probably, you know, obviously fewer resources than its competitors. So he looks for, I think, points of leverage. And I think developing uh, his own programming, you know, is a, way, is a way to embellish the Amazon ecosystem uh, and maybe differentiate it a little bit from competitors. Uh, you know, he's also working on replacing um, you know, a, a DVD business that has probably declined, you know, pretty steadily over the past 10 years and was a, a big part of Amazon's business. And so he's moved to streaming uh, and, and, in, and in competition with Netflix and um, is, you know, is, is uh, keeping up with Netflix in, in the world of original content. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. So Amazon came out with AWS. Given their core business, AWS is a huge company. Right. Um, and given where it's going, you said it was going to be a lot of other companies. Um, although at the time, they were way ahead. Yeah. Way ahead. What drove that? Right. Well, it's a, there's a chapter in the book um, that, sure, you're right. Thank you. Uh, how did Amazon come up with AWS and really lead and initiate this age of cloud services? And I devote a chapter to, to really what is a rough period in Amazon history. You know, 2003 to 2005, their technical infrastructure is a mess. You know, they have to go to, uh, you know, they, they have to like revise their infrastructure, um, which s slowly they do. Uh, but one problem is that the developers in the organization are having a very hard time testing any of their products. And Bezos is railing about this, uh, you know, inside, inside the ST meetings that, you know, people are coming in unprepared and haven't properly been experimenting and testing. And, you know, and he's, he's yelling at Rick Dalzell, a CIO, uh, and asking, you know, what's going on. Uh, now, a couple of other things are happening at the same time. One is that Amazon's eyes, like, like a lot of everyone else in the tech industry, have opened to the power of developers and APIs. So they're beginning to offer services and open up uh, to developers and allow kind of, you know, third-party websites to use some Amazon data to come in and sample the rankings without scraping the website. So there already is something called Amazon Web Services. Now the third ingredient is, as I mentioned before, books are really, he's a voracious reader and books are at the, are at the genesis of so many of these big steps that he takes. And he's just read a book by an author named Steve Grand, who's a video game designer. He, uh, he created the game Creation, kind of like an artificial intelligence uh, that came out in the 90s. And Grand is writing about how to create artificial life. And he basically argues that what you need to do are create building blocks, or what he calls you know, primitives, and then let you know, the alchemy of creation you know, go from there. Uh, and and you know, one of Jeff's, I think, remarkable abilities is, is to read a book like that, which is sort of dense and challenging, and to, and to like extrapolate from it and, and implant the insight into a completely different context. And so he comes into some of these brainstorming meetings around what was then called Amazon Web Services. And he's like, instead of kind of telling developers what to offer them, we should really just create primitives, you know, building blocks, basic building blocks, and let the alchemy that these developers, you know, conduct just, you know, build from there. And at the same time, this is what's going to solve their, their problems with testing. You know, the Amazon realized that they need something like this as well. And he, he goes into a board meeting and they, they pitch it. Uh, and you know, the, the board members are like, why would we ever do this? You know, we need to expand internationally and the business isn't profitable. And Jeff says, because we need it too. And it, it takes off from there. They get together and they brainstorm primitives like compute and storage and payments. And at the time, executives or you know, employees are leaving because Amazon stock is in the tank and the culture is adversarial. But they get a couple people to go and pursue some of these primitives. And there's an executive who goes to South Africa and works on the service that'll be EC2. And S3, the storage service, takes root in Seattle. And I think they were probably surprised by how it took off. 
But I think that was the intent to, to allow developers to come in and use these primitives in ways that were surprising. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, is, is the culture different than other tech firms? Well, it, it, it most definitely is, right? It, it is, as you all probably have friends uh, or you know, former colleagues at Amazon, it can be a challenging place to work, right? It is adversarial, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not a comfortable place. A lot of that starts with Jeff. You know, he has a high standard and really expects everyone, you know, to meet that standard. And, um, you know, he, he actually, you can go look at the Amazon values on their website, and there's one that I think is disagree and commit. And he talks about how he's really not in favor of social cohesion, which is a, probably another way of saying kind of just politeness, you know. And the, you know, he, he sort of feels like people are, you know, make efforts to be agreeable, you know, when they shouldn't. Um, and you know, it's uh, it is it is I think a challenging place. It's also it's also a retailer in, in a lot of ways still. So you know, they're frugal to the bone, right? I mean, they you know their cost they they build low prices on top of a, of, of, of a very efficient cost structure. So unlike you know, the, you know, the lavish perks of, of working at a place like Microsoft or Google, like you don't get much at Amazon. And they take pride in that, right? That you pay for parking and you pay for food and you know, your options are really backloaded um, you know, because uh, it's the cult of the customer and they're gonna pass all that off in the form of lower prices. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, my memory, and, and it's not something that I, I research very deeply for the book, but my memory is that it was actually Amazon uh, in, you know, for years looking for a music strategy. You know, they, they were going to, they were, I think they were going to use Janus to, to do a Rhapsody-like music subscription service and then, you know, had to kind of cancel that right before launch because so many people had bought iPods and it wouldn't work on iPods. And, and finally, kind of stumbling upon the idea that they could launch an MP3 store and compete on DRM with Apple, and it was only after finally, after maybe one or two years of getting of negotiations, launching an MP3 store, and then you know they thought that would be a competitive advantage, but very quickly Apple just copied it, uh, so it wasn't. And there hasn't been a lot of the same pressure in the in the um, you know in the ebook world for. D DRM list books, and I'm not sure why that would be. Um, you know, maybe because uh, we don't really read on PCs. You know, it's um, you know it's a very kind of device oriented uh, experience. There's not there really isn't a lot of free sharing. To my previous point, not a lot of piracy of eBooks, and so it's not something that customers have really agitated for. I don't I don't hear many people saying I I'd really love to be able to read my book on my Kindle and my Nook. Right, it's people tend to be, you know, locked into one of the ecosystems. That's my guess. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Did the Washington Post come up in my conversations? I, I would have to admit that the news of the acquisition of the Washington Post took me completely by surprise. I'd love to say that I predicted it, but in fact, I was, I think, stupefied would be the right word, uh, and 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 then of course hit with a wave of panic. Because it was August, and I had, you know, the book was at the copy editors. I mean, you know, frankly, no one saw it coming. And the story there is that, you know, the Graham family, you know, finally decided to sell. Uh, you know, the the asset was was no longer kind of working, and they shopped it around. And you know, Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, was interested. And you know, I suspect that Jeff wasn't looking for it, but saw the opportunity. You know, he believes this kind of long term perspective, and and um, you know inventiveness and operating discipline can help revive this franchise. And I, I would expect that somewhere down the line, you know, he uses it to, to nurture Amazon and the Kindle. Um, he, he, he probably had to buy it independently. I'm, not, I'm sure his shareholders wouldn't love the idea of Amazon buying a newspaper. But I suspect in some way that uh, you know, he views it 
like the previous question about video, you know, as, as a differentiator for Amazon's devices mm -hmm. and services. That's my guess. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, but the difference with, to, to carry on to that question, I mean, when he bought it, it was certainly a surprise to a lot of people. And the newspaper industry was in serious decline. I mean, newspapers all across the country are under major, major pressure, and they're folding commonly, which makes one wonder, what was he hoping to achieve? I think he thinks he can revive it. And look, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a drop in his uh, bucket, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know he's got he's got 25 billion, uh, seemingly like an endless ability to uh, diversify himself or amplify his insight. I talk in in the book and in the Business Week excerpts about his question mark emails. I don't know if you read that, but it's you know the way in which well if he gets a customer email or discovers something that's wrong with Amazon, he'll just forward it to the appropriate executive or employee with a question mark, and of course they you know cancel all their plans for the next week and go about addressing it and and it's a panic attack but I also I recently heard that, that employees at the Washington Post are starting to get question mark emails <laughs> so you know it's uh, I think he you know he he would look he's it's not a it's not uh, it's not philanthropy I think he 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 built an editorial business with the Kindle um, he's a huge reader and I think you know he believes that he can turn it around thank you yes Sure. Yeah, the, the question of profitability. In fact, um, while I was talking, Amazon announced quarterly earnings. So maybe someone could just check to see if they reported, I'm serious, a profit or a loss. I'd be interested to know and what the stock price is doing. Um, so Amazon you know, took a beating for being unprofitable during the dot-com bust, and the stock went way down when people's blinders came off. But then over the course of many years, starting in 2003, they started to make money. And Earned a lot of credibility with institutional shareholders. You know, flashed a pretty good profit in 2009 and 2010 as Amazon Prime, you know, took effect. And you know, they, I sort of think of it as a Costco within Amazon. You know, people are paying now for the ability to shop there and are, you know, very loyal. And you know, so the, the Amazon flywheel started to work. Profits took off. You know, big institutional shareholders like Leg Mason, you know, came aboard. And Amazon started to you know, be thought of in the same category as a Microsoft or an app, Apple or a Google. And one reason that they had so much credibility is that they were operating the company in a very disciplined way and calling their shots, right? Hitting their guidance, you know, doing everything that share investors want to see. And then starting about two years ago, they said they were entering into a growth phase and telegraphed that they were going to expand internationally and build new fulfillment centers and start going into new devices and shareholders are uh, you know are along for the ride now you know they know amazon is profitable and we've seen it before it's just that they're hiding their profits they're investing and building new fulfillment centers and doing all these things so there's a lot of faith and a lot of it has to do with bezos's credibility as a founder and a lot of it has to do with the way that they've run the business very efficiently you know like a like a ball player calling a shots you know they 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 believe and we'll see if, if they lost money this quarter or if they end up losing money again this year, if some of that confidence will begin to waver. It'll, it'll be interesting to watch. Does anybody know what the... Oh, they're reporting Thursday, so I'm wrong. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So Amazon's ambitions and hardware is the question. And the answer to all those questions is yes. I mean, there's really no, there's no limit to, to, you know, to his ambitions there. And I, and I think that there are probably you know, executives on the, on, the, on the leadership team that are whispering to themselves that this is crazy. And I would also guess that his CFO, Tom Skutak, is you know, losing hair and saying, when does this end? But Bezos just believes, and it's, this is Bezos, he spends a lot of time on the hardware businesses, that you know, Amazon needs to be everywhere that its customers are, and you know, that you can't just rely on apps on other you know, companies' ecosystems. He spent the summer, Jeff spent the summer in Silicon Valley, really 
working at Lab 126. You know, pro I would imagine to the horror and consternation of all the employees there, uh, because you know it's great to get the attention of the founder, and it's probably you know uh, difficult or challenging. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're going to see an Amazon set-top box in the next couple of weeks, if not days. I think that they've probably been close to announcing a phone, uh, but you know, the, the the bar is high, and they need to do something different. Uh, and so we, Bloomberg reported recently that they were experimenting with um, uh, some, you know, a, a wireless network, a dedicated wireless network based on the bandwidth from a satellite carrier. Um, you know, there have been reports about different kind of 3D displays. So I suspect that they're looking for that differentiating factor beyond price. And it's another way in which Amazon sometimes can offer something different. They did that with the Kindle Fire. But again, the bar is high, and there are plenty of discount phones. And then to the, to the last question about wearables, I absolutely believe that they'll be in that market as well. You can imagine Bezos would like nothing less than for us to walk into a Walmart or any store and with our little internet-connected glasses see that he's selling the same item for less. So you can bet they'll be in that market. Yes, in the back. Right, you know, how does, you know, why, why do some companies get away with such diverse ambitions while other companies are kind of criticized for it? You know, it go, I, I really do feel like it goes back to the, cre the, the unique credibility that a founder has. And found, you know, the few people in this world that have proven themselves both as entrepreneurs and as operators get a lot of leeway. And um, you know, you, you actually kind of back into what I think is one of the more interesting questions around Amazon, which is what happens, you know, if and when Jeff Bezos decides to do something else, to more, spend more time with his, you know, four other companies, or or go into space, because uh, of course he's building rockets as part of Blue Origin, and you know, the, it's a you know, the, it's an important question because the company is so diversified. You know, who else on this planet can run? You know, an online retailer, a digital, you know, hardware and services business, and an enterprise software company. Um, there are very few people, and he's got some executives around him that have kind of grown up, you know, with him, and you know, you know, kind of working, you know, alongside him and studying how his brain works. But you know, I don't, I don't see the same versatility from them. So I've heard from you know a lot of long-term Amazon shareholders that the day they start to worry is the day that Jeff decides to do something else. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, sir. You know, right? So, so Amazon. As with all, the question is about you know their acquisition of real estate, and as with all things, um, they were frugal, right? And they they uh, they were they had these facilities in uh, near the kingdom, and then you although you don't call it that anymore, right? Uh, and, and Soto, and and then they had the Columbia building. They rented a couple of floors on Second Avenue amid the you know uh, that interesting neighborhood, and then the Pacific Medical Center, um, you know former hospital. And then renting from Paul Allen, right, in South Lake Union. And in really the last two years, I mean, the growth of this company has been incredible, right? They've gone from uh, you know, 60,000 employees to 90,000. Um, you know, probably, frankly, saturated the Seattle market, you know, not only with the folks that work at Amazon, but the folks that have heard about how difficult it is to work at Amazon. And so they're expanding their opening offices in Detroit and expanding in San Francisco and in New York. So part of it's growing up, and of course they're building in the Denny Triangle, and and part of it is um, you know probably trying to brand the company and, and also keep up with some of the rivals who do have kind of big, iconic campuses, and we've seen other transitions in, in his thinking as well. For a long time, Amazon wouldn't advertise. You know it was it was, he thought it was extraneous and it was a it was cost, and they were trying to get the cost down to allow for low prices. And he changed his mind, you know, with the Kindle business, and now there are quite a bit of Amazon advertisements on television. Thank you for the question. I think we have time for a couple more. Yes. Uh, 
That's a great question. Does Amazon plan on opening physical stores like Walmart? Uh, so, of course, I don't know. They always say that they consider it. Um, the executives in, from the 90s who, who uh, left early on say that it was, it, they always considered it. I think it's likely. You know, I think that um, Amazon has a key advantage. And I'll use, I'll use you guys maybe uh, you know, a little unfairly here. But you, know, you walk into it when you guys announce a new, a new tablet or a new product, you know, there's some energy in the store. And when you're between product announcements, you know, Microsoft stores can, can feel a little gloomy. And I always thought that, this will sound weird, but that one problem is that you're just selling Microsoft products, right? Um, not that they're not great products, but, but you know, it's, it's, uh, you've got sort of a limited audience there. Whereas Amazon can open a store and they can sell you know, Kindle Fires and their phones or their set-top box and the Kindle e-readers. And you know, that might also be kind of gloomy and empty between product cycles. But guess what? You know, they're also a retailer. So they will have uh, you know, the, the top-selling books of, of the week and the top-selling DVDs. And um, you know, they, could, they might have groceries. I mean, I, I, I don't think they'll do big box stores, um, but uh, you know, maybe more showrooms. But they could also stock that with you know the kind of you know the most popular items. They could do Amazon lockers somewhere so that people could come pick up their online purchases. It's a guess, but the, their model is so interesting. You know, being not just a hardware seller uh, but also a retailer, that I think they would have a lot of flexibility to go and and uh, do something interesting when it came to, to physical retail. And of course, the the biggest thing which I just skipped over is you know they've really surrendered their sales tax fight. So the reason not to do it for a long time was that they would be required to collect sales tax. And now in about half the states, they already are. And uh, it might be another way in which they leverage that to their advantage. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, so does, will Amazon Fresh ever take off? And you guys here have been, you know, like, uh, lucky to have uh, been sampling that since I think 2007. Well, so you know, back to Bezos's ambitions. You know, um, he he wants to create Walmart. You know, that's the goal to be the biggest retailer in the world. You know, maybe even to be the biggest company in the world. And to get to that scale, to Walmart scale, you would need grocery and apparel. And if you really just watch the pace of announcements from Amazon, it's it's they they really have focused on those two areas quite a bit in the last few years. And apparel, you know, I don't think I would buy clothes from Amazon, but you know, they've, they've acquired, um, I think they just announced that they were opening some design studios in New York to take photographs of clothes. You know, Bezos himself went to like a, one of these Vogue magazine sponsored balls in New York, the Met Ball. Not, I would imagine, because he likes that kind of socializing, but because it coincided with an announcement about an Amazon apparel service. So really kind of getting off the grocery question, but it's, I think it, they, it, they go hand in hand. Amazon has been experimenting on how to make that work here now for six years, seven years. They just expanded to LA. There's, there are reports that's coming to you know, San Francisco. And I would imagine that that rolls out nationwide and that they have you know, basically learned how to do that efficiently and to piggyback it on top of their existing distribution system. In which case, you know, the everything store really will be the everything store. You'll be able to buy vegetables on Amazon. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Right. Yeah, how do, you, how do you kind of allow that bottomless uh, you know, push of ideas? Well, I, you know, I said, I, I guess I thought that there's, you know, there's pressure uh, on, uh, you know, on, on employees to think big. That's a big Bezos phrase, uh, to, to think of big ideas and small ones. I don't, you know, I actually really can't, can't say, you know, how successful they are. I, I know that there are a lot of Amazon employees who, you know, are frustrated with the bureaucracy of the organization as it's grown. I think the experience is probably different from division to division, and in many cases, dependent on who your man manager is or how much the senior leadership team cares about that division. Uh, yeah, I, I do know that 
and this is nothing novel, but there are kind of idea tools inside the, the company's intranet where employees can suggest ideas. You know, not clear to me that that's an effective way to get things done. And, and I, Amazon certainly has its share of frustrated employees who believe that it is hard to affect outcomes. Thank you. Yes, Amy. Okay, I could try those. Well, uh, well, what's next for me is the easy one, and uh, that's to go back to Bloomberg Business Week and start earning my paycheck again after the book stuff dies down, and to go back to my twin five-year-old daughters, who I've been uh, particularly in the last two weeks a little neglectful of as a parent. Uh, so definitely no other book projects for the foreseeable future, thank God. And then international is a major avenue of Amazon expansion. Really, the retail site is, is in, I think, 10 countries. And again, you know, they're nowhere near Walmart scale in that respect. So a lot, a lot of runway, uh, but a lot of you know, additional complexity. Um, you know, I just read before we started that they were opening two new fulfillment centers in the Czech Republic. And in some of these countries, particularly in Europe, uh, you know, Amazon sort of bent against unionization is a big problem. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's difficult for them to kind of uh, take advantage of a temporary workforce for the holidays in the way they do in the United States. And as we've seen, there have been, they've had strikes in Germany. Um, there are parts of the world where they haven't expanded yet, where you know, the shipping infrastructure is really immature. Um, and the credit card kind of processing infrastructure doesn't exist, places like Russia, where it'll be interesting to see if they can make that work. You know, you probably need a new model there because there's not a FedEx or UPS. So a lot of runway, but a lot of new challenges, and Amazon will have to get, you know, it will get incredibly more complex as it expands. And, and actually, one thing we've seen them do uh, in some countries like Brazil and India is, is roll out the Kindle. You know, or the Kindle Fire, and 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 as a maybe a little bit of a Trojan horse to starting a retail business there. Uh, so they have a lot of different ways now that they can expand internationally. And then the third question, of course, I've forgotten. Google and search. You know, for a while that was a big problem for Amazon. That you know, in the at the at the kind of dawn of of Google's hegemony. Um, People were starting their searches on Google, and Amazon and eBay were having to pay taxes, you know, to Google because they would have to, you know, if someone was going to search for uh, HD TVs, they were probably going to do it on Google, and to get that traffic, Amazon was going to have to bid for it, and and of course uh, they were bidding against eBay and other retailers, and the price was going up. But over the last few years, um, you know, as Amazon Prime has, has taken hold, and people have become loyal to Amazon. Uh, they, I don't think they've had as much of a problem. They probably fixed their own internal search problems. That was a, a long, drawn out, and kind of anguished effort to figure out how to make search work on Amazon. And now we see actually the numbers show that people are starting their e-commerce searches on Amazon. Uh, and, and, and perhaps Google kind of lost its focus on, on uh, online shopping as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. In terms of philanthropy, well, yeah, the Seattle Times um, did that series last year that criticized Amazon for its lack of civic engagement, and I thought you know that was fair. Um, it's to go back to a previous point, a company so immersed in the mechanics of its own figuring out its own complex systems, and so wedded to frugality and you know taking every penny out of the cost structure to support low prices. That they haven't been doing a lot, and they're very secretive because you know their you know perspective is a competitive advantage, and they don't want to be easily copied. So even though they're right in downtown Seattle, you know, in in, in a lot of respects they're invisible. It, you know, in a lot of people feel they're invisible in the Seattle community. You know, I think um, we might you know they they tend to respond to some of that outside criticism. I don't know if if the needle's moved yet. Um, but it'll be it'll be interesting to watch. You know, it, a lot with a lot of these you know companies, and I'm sure Microsoft went through a, a version of this as well. It's you know the the company at at 50,000 employees still has the mindset of the company at 10,000 employees. You know, even though they're big, they still see themselves as the underdog and the upstart, 
and the entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, and they the, so some of that same mentality remains from when they were really hiding out because they didn't want anyone to copy what they were doing. Thank you. All right, final question. Thank you. So do you see Amazon sitting on top of a huge wealth of customers getting into the game of the Amazon marketplace? Using that to create a marketplace? Well, they already are, right? Um, under uh, Jeff Blackburn, um, the M&A chief, or the biz dev chief, um, I think it's actually one of their one of their kind of secret weapons, and it's a it's a high margin business tucked away amid the low margin businesses, and they use it to great effect. Uh, to go back to my, you know, my quote about uh, you know we don't have many big advantages, so we weave a chain of smaller advantages. You know, you get your Kindle in the mail, and you turn it on, and it knows who you are, and it has your library in the cloud, um, or um, you know you uh, have the screensaver. On, on your Kindle Fire and it's tailoring advertisements towards your Amazon purchases. Or increasingly, they're syndicating ads. And so, you know, I, I move around. It's actually funny, as an obsessive author, I'm checking my Amazon rankings all the time, like to a disgusting amount of <laughs> self absorption. And because I'm clicking on my page on Amazon, when I go elsewhere on the web, that is syndicating Amazon's ads, I will see ads for my own book because <laughs> they think I'm interested in, you know, in buying it, which I'll do if sales are low. I will start to buy it. <laughs> uh, so already it, it is, I think, one of the kind of great hidden aspects of the business, the way in which they're leveraging customer information to build an ad business. And one, again, that will is high margin, that will support, support not only low prices, but the giveaways. You know, the, you know, the, the free, you know, the, the movies they're producing, the, the TV shows they're producing, the free shipping they subsidize, you know, all in pursuit of greater market share and, you know, uh, loyalty from customers and, and building the everything store. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. And I will happily sign any books.